What's up, everyone? Welcome to this episode of Becoming the 1% Podcast. My guest today is Steve Lutsk. This is a very cool episode. So the target of today's discussion primarily was the removal of the dad bod epidemic. That's something that we see a lot of times across pretty much every single type of dad that we get. It just seems like as soon as you become, you know, a parent, time management is an issue, diet is an issue, exercise is an issue. A lot of people struggle with that once you get to that point in life where you've got your kids and you've got all those extra responsibilities. So today we're talking about prioritization, time management, how exactly it is that you can delegate your time even in the most scarce of circumstances where time is almost non-available. This is a really good episode for you fathers out there. You're going to enjoy it. Hope you guys like it. This episode of Becoming the 1% Podcast. Got entrepreneurial. We got some really big things coming. You have to have the willingness. It's an A or B. Try and use it as a tool. This is phenomenal. On details make up a person. It's what we believe in the industry. Steve Lutzk, welcome to the show, buddy. Thanks so much. This is amazing. Awesome opportunity. Guys, if you haven't seen this place in person, the videos don't do it justice. <laughs> Thanks, absolutely man. incredible. I'm really excited to be here. I appreciate it. Appreciate you making the trip, too. Of course. Where'd you, where'd you fly in from? Came in from LA, 90 okay. minute flight, easy peasy. Not bad. Nope. Anywhere, anywhere in the neighboring, you know, states around us, it's really not bad. And Phoenix International is so highly traveled. Everywhere yeah. flies through there. So it was it's easy. Great. I would have come twice the distance easily. You the man. Oh, I appreciate that, dude. <laughs> yeah. So at the beginning of every episode, I like to give the opportunity for the guests to sort of open mic it, give an introduction about yourself. Obviously, we're gonna talk about health and fitness. We're gonna talk about in particular your demographic, how you zoned in on, you know, dads, men. And that sort of sort of thing, but I want to hear about you. How did you even get started in this industry? Yeah, so I, my personal fitness journey started early in college. Pretty typical. My dating life wasn't going the way that I thought it should be going. You know, you're in high school, you watch all these movies, and you're like, oh, once I get to college, it's going to be different. And nothing changed. Nothing changed at all. My confidence was low. Hated taking my shirt off. And I noticed that the guys that seemed to have better social lives were taking care of themselves a lot better. So, you know, success leaves clues. I, I took some hints, started doing some push-ups in my dorm room. Eventually, after you know four months, six months, finally got the courage to go to the gym because that was a terrifying place to me, man. The, mm. the gym was re really scary. I was weak. I was skinny fat, skinny arms, big pot belly that used to hit the table when I would play beer pong, even though I had skinny <laughs> arms, it was a bad sight. So, so the, the freshman 15 kicked in for oh, you. The freshman you were, 15 was yeah. there before I even went to college. So Really? But, yeah, but it was gotcha. a, a weird body distribution, no confidence. So started doing push-ups and figured out that if I did 20 push-ups this day, if I go for 21 the next day, I'm usually able, able to hit it. So kind of figured out early progressive overload on myself by uh -huh. myself on accident. And after a few months, started seeing lines in my arms where I'd never seen lines before, started getting chest muscles where I'd never seen that before. And I was like, all right, I'm going to get the courage to go to the gym. Had some friends teach me how to do some basic lifts, started doing progressive overload there. And so the muscular changes happened normal amount of time, three months, six months. But the mm -hmm. changes that happened inside of my brain were almost instantaneous. So you couldn't really see what was going on under my shirt, under my sweatshirt. But I felt like a totally different man, started getting dates. And, you know, when you get something that reinforces the habit like that, then it's pretty easy to stick to. And got more and more into it over the years. By the end of the college, I went from barely being able to lift the bar to, you know, being able to max out at 225, which was something that I never thought I'd be able to do in yeah. my life and moved to LA, pursued uh, comedy, movies, things like that for a little while. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't making money with that. It's really tough to make money with that. Especially so I've when heard. You first start out. So <laughs> I was bartending to supplement my bartending in income. I started a personal training business. Didn't think I was going to like it because it's like, I like this thing. I don't want my, I don't want to hate the gym because it becomes my workplace. Mm, very That's, good. Uh, I was a little hesitant to do that at first, but yeah. started training friends. Then I turned, turned out I liked it. Then I Googled fitness marketing. I found this guy, Bedros Koulian, and I learned yeah. how to, to market from him. I started a boot camp, and I was like, oh, wow, I have control over this. I don't have control over whether or not a casting director chooses me. It doesn't matter how talented you are. You're not the, you're not the gatekeeper there. But if mm -hmm. I work really, really hard, and become a good trainer and figure out the marketing, get better at communication, sales, all that stuff. And really the sky's the limit. So I fell in love with the fitness business, 
had a personal training business boot camp for six, seven years, went online in 2017 as kind of a side hustle just to supplement my personal training income. Mm-hmm. Then COVID hit and I was forced to, to make more reels and TikToks. And I got really, really lucky with the TikTok algorithm and went from 200 followers to 5,200 followers overnight with one viral video. And then it just started skyrocketing. And I was able to, over the course of the last few years, go 100% online and... Now I'm sitting in Arizona in a kick-ass podcast studio. That's so, awesome. Yeah. It's, That's outstanding. It's, thanks, man. Uh, one interesting point, uh, backing up a little bit to the early introduction you had to the gym, you said that you, you saw the physical results in about 60 to 90 days, but you said the mental results came to you instantly. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit more on what exactly that means? Yeah, I just felt more confident. It's re- kind of tough to describe, but it's something that I've heard other guys talk about. You just carry yourself differently. You're, you you realize that if you work hard enough, you start to see, you know, physical results, but the mental results come right away. And it, it was just, um, it, I went <laughs> feeling like Clark Kent to Superman pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. If we wanna, I know that's DC. I don't hey, know thoughts we'll, on that. Either way, we'll take it. <laughs> uh, it, it because in, in, in my experience, it's, it's sometimes the opposite. Sometimes people will see, even within 60 days or sooner, they'll see a physical change, a small yeah. physical change, which anyone who understands anything about periodization knows you will have a physical change. Even if you have a bad coach, usually in the first couple of months, if you haven't done anything and you go in and you work out, you'll see a change. Yeah. But a lot of times the mental thing seems to take a lot longer to click. Do yeah. you think that in in your experience with your clients, do they resound more with your situation where the mental thing clicks fast or is it sort of slow? Yeah, everyone's different in that regard. The way that I keep my clients on board is to let them start seeing wins right away. A lot of them are fat loss clients, so they want to see the scale go down mm-hmm. right away. Sure. And some guys have immediate success they start fasting and they'll lose you know two pounds five pounds in the first way a week they start flushing out water and then other guys fat loss is a little slower so you have them focus on those other victories they're getting the numbers going up on in the gym and, and you tell them listen man when the numbers are going up in, in in the training software when you're adding a push up here or five pounds to a lift there that's just a preview of the changes that you're going to see in the mirror so you have to have some form of, of win that you're tracking and that's going to be a the preview of, of what you're going to see in the future. And I think that helps reinforce the um, the mental component to it. But I haven't really had too many guys where their results happen in the mirror and they're still not in a good place mentally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good point. I think it also very strongly speaks to the importance of tracking your workouts, yep. of tracking your metrics, yeah. because math doesn't lie. And if you're If your lifts are going up, if the time under tension is going up, if you're improving on whatever periodization app or or even if you're still one of those guys writing down your workouts, as long as you can tell I'm in a, you know, I'm in a four week mesocycle, I'm in my second week, I'm in my third week, my numbers are going up. I may not look any different when I look in the mirror, even maybe even let's say it's, let's say it's a slow progression individual and they're not even feeling any different, but they can look at that and say, well, the numbers are going up, so I am winning. Would you say that's something that... 100%. That all comes down to trust in the process. You know, mm. in, in fat loss, you can see the numbers go down really, really quickly. But when it comes to the muscles showing up in the mirror, it takes a long time. But the, yeah. the numbers on in, in, in whatever app you're using to train, so mm-hmm. it's a preview of what is to come very quickly down the line. And I was very, very lucky. Like I said, I discovered progressive overload at the very beginning, not even knowing what it was. I kind of saw it like a video game. Mm. You know, when you're playing like a, an RPG and you get the <laughs> yeah. XP points, I was like, all right, I leveled up on dumbbell press. I I saw the guys doing 60-pound dumbbells. I was doing 30s, and I was like, if I can get there, I will probably look like them. And I saw that as like a preview. All right, add five pounds a month within, you know, four months, six months, I will look more mm-hmm. like those guys. And it wasn't long before I surpassed those guys. But yeah. you just got to focus on those numbers and, and make small incremental improvements and trend upwards over time. And that's hey. huge. And you did this with very little or no formal education in no. periodization, kinesiology, nothing. You just nothing. went in there with basically on a mission to just change yourself, and you did this on your own. Exactly. This was like 2002, so there were forums and stuff like that, but I wasn't even really familiar with how to use those. I'd get muscle and fitness if I could find mm-hmm. five bucks to put together as a oh, yeah, college man. student using my 
you know, student ID and meal points and stuff like that. And I'd learned some stuff there, but really early on, before I even went to the gym, it was that push-up tactic. I'd just add one push-up to uh, three sets of push-up, and, and that's a preview. And I was like, I did the same thing with dumbbell presses. I only did like three or four exercises. So talking about getting results when you first start with a bad program, I had the worst programs, man. It was I look at them now, and I was like, what was I doing? But it worked because <laughs> I was doing something, and I was tracking and, and making improvements. So, yeah. yeah. It's, ugh, man, it's, it's both – it. Frankly, it's it's very encouraging. When, when you hear a story like that, when people hear your story, that has to resonate with a lot of them. But sometimes as a coach, when I hear stories like yours, because our stories are very different. I didn't have, I had the formal education yeah. well behind that. I, I did sports and everything since I could walk. But when I hear your story, it's exceptionally encouraging. And it also makes me, it also makes me want to just grab onto the audience and tell them, look, you may be overcomplicating this. A lot of times yeah. it feels like as a coach, you get peppered with questions, especially from beginners, which is a good thing. It's a good thing to find somebody who's more ahead of you in something in anything and Absolutely. ask their advice. That's yep. a good thing. But sometimes I just want people to go to the gym. Yeah. Sometimes I just want to tell them, okay, you're, you're, you sent me three and a half paragraphs worth of information that you're requesting. How many times this month have you set foot into the gym? Sure. Oh, well, I'm planning on hitting it. So it's like, I'm like, okay, well, in the time it took you to write that paragraph, you probably could have gone and at least done some push-ups. Yep. You could have done something. A and your story reinforces that. It reinforces that narrative. Yeah, well, a big problem that guys have, and it, I think a lot of information readily available is a good thing until it isn't because we get analysis paralysis. Like you, you want to find the perfect program and you'll spend – six months research in the pro perfect program when you could have done watch dr mike israel you'll have that yeah, paralysis exactly. ass in 10 seconds <laughs> that's one thing because i did i did a collaboration with him last week I and and a few of the comments i because i have to, i have to dissect myself from my own body sometimes and put it into the audience's eyes and realize a lot of people see him and they're overwhelmed by him. Yeah. They're like, he's, he, I mean, I think he's amazing. I don't understand a word of what he's saying. Talks like a scientist. Talks like a scientist. Yeah. To guys like us, I mean, I get what he's talking about. I fought because this is our world. We study it. We know it. And we enjoy it. But to the average person, I get why analysis paralysis is certainly yeah. out there. I think it's probably like two years into training that you really need to have to figure out what is more optimal. Because mm -hmm. working hard with a mediocre program is, is going to be better than half-assed effort with an expert level crafted program so oh, absolutely so just get in there and, and work really really hard so yeah i think little things that can help are getting used to training to what failure feels like and i learned that from push-ups like i was really really focused on just getting one more push-up and you really have to go within that into that mentality like gone to my head could i do one more rep could i do two more reps and you don't have to do that every single set every single exercise but you have a half decent program and you're taking a lot of your sets close to failure and you're improving from workout to workout, you're going to get much better results than having someone like uh, Dr. Mike Israel tell do a perfectly programmed, <laughs> you know, three phase, 12 yeah. month um, cycle. So just get in there and get after it and get used to training hard. That's one of the, that, that's kind of something that you can't teach that you kind of, kind of work up to really, really grind on those sets. Mm -hmm. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. That works for fitness. That works for all kinds of aspects yeah. of life. And that's another thing. I What I learned from fitness, I brought with me into my professional life and all different aspects. So you can learn a lot about life just from doing push-ups and squats. Absolutely. And it's amazing. It's an essential. She doesn't call you back. The date falls through. You thought it went well. It didn't. All right. Well, that's failure. Yeah. You, you start a business venture. The, the venture <laughs> falls through the cracks in the floor. It yeah. fails. It falls on its face. That's failure. But if you get used to the feeling of failure, especially failure in a physical form, yeah. it somehow turns the volume down on failure in real life for, it does. for me. Yeah. And then you could say the same thing about acting in LA. Get used to being rejected. Get used to failing and oh, don't attach any emotions to that. Notoriously no. tough. Yeah. I, I mean, acting in Los Angeles, it's like the the, the casting couch. It's like notoriously <laughs> tough to become an actor or an actress in any in yeah. anything. Luckily, I never saw one of those That's famous good. casting couches. <laughs> when you were doing it, was that before or after the Me Too movement hit? Oh, that was way before. Way before. Yeah, I was acting and we're trying to act, I should say, uh, late, mid-2000s, like 2007 to 2000, 
11 so gotcha damn. did you find that anything because it, it's interesting I, I i never took it into any sort of a career path but i i did it in high school and whatnot i always sure. had a dramatic side do you find that those types of character qualities actually converse when being a coach or being an influencer or being whatever it is you're trying to present to a camera yeah. do you find that you're much more comfortable in that setting because of your background 100 percent. so I didn't really have any success with any type of dramatic acting or being on camera for a show or anything like that. But I got a couple of small commercials mm -hmm. and I did a lot of training for commercials. Those really interested me. So the cool thing about commercials, at least 10, 15 years ago and, and beyond that, is you could book one national commercial and get residual paychecks in the amount of six figures for, for an entire year. So you book two or three commercials for the year. I love that idea. I mean, it would have been cool to be on like a sitcom or something like that, but booking two car commercials and making $200,000 a year, who wouldn't want that? So I took yeah. my commercial training seriously and you know, commercials are 30 seconds and you gotta be happy and you gotta be big energy and you gotta be able to sell a product. So I took the training from that I put it into my reels, put it into my TikToks and I think that served me a lot. I still hear my my, my acting coaches when I'm making my TikToks or, or, or my short form videos, smile, Steve, bigger, Steve, bigger, mm -hmm. Steve, smile, whatever you, whatever you see on, whatever you're doing, the camera will amplify for 10 X. So if you're phoning it in, the camera is going to show you that you're phoning it in 10 times. But if you're big energy, if you think you're big, you need to go a little bit bigger. And that's, what's going to capture mm -hmm. people's attention. And that can lead to a lot of success on social media. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, and, and when it came to in-person dialogue, recorded conversation. For me, I mean, I had to take a master class on public speaking. Yeah. I had to, because we started this and I was astounded at how bad yeah. I sounded when it was done. It was almost unwatchable. And just like you, people need to understand that if you're gonna go into any kind of marketing, any kind of media, it's like working out, it's a muscle. You, yeah. If you don't flex it, if you don't know how to train it, if you've never been coached in it, you might actually need to go out and seek that sort of thing yeah. in order to really get it. Some people I'm sure are much more natural than others, but even people who are great like that, they still have training. Oh, 100%, and you need to put in the reps just like anything. So I feel pretty comfortable on, on camera for TikToks, but podcasting, you've done how many episodes? Hundreds, probably at this point. What are we at? What are we at? Probably 90. I think we're darn close to 100, aren't close we? Close to 100. That's close a, to 100. That's a lot of hours. That's yeah. a lot of hours behind <laughs> behind the mic. I, I've done maybe 10 of them. Yeah. So you're better at this than me. But no one saw my first 1,000 Instagram posts. And you mm -hmm. just got to keep grinding out those reps until you're as good as you are at podcasting or, or as, as, as anyone. So yeah. yeah, it directly relates to everything. Shifting gears and going toward what now you have deemed your target audience, which yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, you would say it's it's men, fathers, specifically fathers who are trying to reverse the dad bod epidemic. That is, is, it, a, the, is that about right? The dad bod mandemic, dude. Yes. Ooh, <laughs> dig it. Yeah. Well, we can, I think, comfortably say that. I mean, obesity is the real pandemic. Obesity is the real problem that oh. we see here in America. It's not going away. In fact, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. How? By the day. First of all, how did you land on that niche demographic? Because that is a very, very specific group of people. And what is it that attracted you toward men wanting to lose the dad bod? Right place, right time. So 2017 was when I started my online program. My boot camp that I had for, for years in LA was... All, all ages, all, all, um, all sexes, and not really niche down. And it was fine. It was great. But when I went online, I got a coach for that, and they said, you have to niche down. And I said, I want to work with, with guys around my age. And right around that time, a lot of my friends were starting to become dads. And at the same time, dad bod became uh, a popular term in the vernacular. So as far as I know, I'm the first guy online who started talking about dad bods, and I just ran with it. When you're you're first to market like that, you get the advantage. And I really targeted that niche. Like, there was guys that I could relate to. It's a lot of my friends. I saw the problems they were struggling with. You know, I did a lot of surveys. What What are the types of things that are giving you the biggest issues? What specifically is causing you to continue to struggle with that issue? And so I based my program around that. And can you answer those for me? Those 100%. are two very, very good questions. Start yeah. with the first one. So obviously when you're a busy dad, you start to have kids. The first thing that goes away is your time. You don't have five days a week, six days a week to train two hours in the gym. Mm -hmm. You don't have necessarily a lot of time to cook every single meal. All right. Um, so you have to be really, really optimal with 
both those things. You need a way to be able to train that works your schedule. So maybe getting to the gym just three times a week. And since your workouts may have to just be 40 minutes, what are we going to focus on? We're going to focus on compound lifts, the lifts that give you the best bang for your buck. So, you know, wrist curls probably aren't going to be the best option, but a squat or a thruster or something like that, it's going to serve you really, really well. And if it's really well structured and you understand the basics of progressive overload and do things like supersets and other things that help you utilize your time, then you're going to have a solid workout program. You're going to be able to get results. It's going to be given to you, and you're not going to have to worry about taking up 10 hours a week to train. And on the diet side of things, a lot of the guys I worked with weren't really willing or able to obviously cook every single meal, but even meal prep and, and just knowing what the basics are when it comes to nutrition. So mm. that's why I was a fan of intermittent fasting right from the beginning. Mm. And I understand it's flawed and I understand that it's not magic, but for a busy guy who's just looking for a way to control their calories, I think it's a fantastic tool and even research what kind of, shows that. What kind of window for intermittent, for intermittent fasting, what do you tell your clients? Stop eating at seven, don't eat again until 11? Yeah, I give them a lot of flexibility with that. Um, and the very first thing I say is, listen, there's a lot that's said about intermittent fasting, but the most recent research says that there's really not any additional benefit other than helping you control your calories. So be flexible with it. Find the window that works for you. You may want to start with something like 10 to 6 or, you know, noon to 8. You don't want to mess up family dinner time. And at the same time, if you need to be more flexible with it, even giving yourself a, a 10 hour eating window or, or 12 hour eating window, just understand mm -hmm. that it's just a tool to help control calories. So take what you would eat on a day where you only had eight hour window, an eight hour window and try to eat that same amount in mm -hmm. 10 hours mm -hmm. or 12 hours. That's where we see it uh, working the best. Yeah, we, uh, we briefly earlier mentioned Dr. Mike and I, it's random that we did because I, yesterday I was watching one of his earliest Ted talks ever. This is back when he actually had hair and he, <laughs> oh, wow. the yeah, seventies back in the day. <laughs> and he brought up an excellent point around this exact topic specifically pertaining to um when should i eat when should i fast should i do that at all and how exactly what what is the importance of calories versus the number of calories and when we consume those calories and so essentially he took those three talking points and put them from most important to least important and yep. the general consensus of it was if you structure your meals to where you know exactly what it is in a day that you eat, you're like, okay, in a day, here are my three meals. I'm not eating more. I'm not eating less. If you know what they are and you've got them planned and you don't deviate, then ultimately it doesn't really matter yes. when you eat them. If you fasted the whole day and ate all three meals at 5 p.m., then went to bed you would most likely get the exact same results, whether yes. it's deficit or or the opposite, you're going to get the same results. So fasting, I like the I like the way you're taking it because some people treat fasting like the second coming of I Christ. I used to be one of them. Where, where it's, oh, yeah. it's the greatest thing ever. It's going to change your entire, you're going to go into ketosis. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, it really is just a way to Use the clock for self-control. But I think this is a good thing because it takes away some of the, the, the minutiae details that guys get stuck up on. Well, if I put cream in my coffee, is this going to break my fast? Or uh, things like that, that they would stress out over. Or I didn't eat dinner within my window, so I just skipped dinner altogether. And th th the good news is when you have flexibility and you understand that concept of that the total calories for the day, your total protein for the day is going to be the most important thing for most mm -hmm. guys, yeah. most cases, then it removes a lot of the stress around the little details yeah. around it. And that's a good thing. The, the quality of the food you eat being in first place as far as importance, I love the that. amount of food that you eat in the day being the second most importance, and the time with which you eat the meals being the least of the three yeah. in terms of importance. Well, the good thing about the quality of your food is when you increase the quality of your food, it's a lot easier to not overeat. And if you're eating ultra-processed garbage, you're a bottomless pit. You're never going to get full. It's stripped of the fiber. And, and a lot of that ultra-processed garbage has chemicals in it that are directly going to increase your yeah, appetite. They want you eating more. Yeah. If you eat potato chips, is, is it potato chips that have that? Once you pop, you can't stop. That's yeah. scientific. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a chemical component inside of certain junk food yeah. derivatives. Is it that Pringles? 
It's, 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 <laughs> probably. They can't even call Pringles chips, I don't think, or they don't call them chips. They're their own thing. They're, they're I don't know if it's else. a legal thing or, or what. They have no potatoes at all. Is that what it is? Is that why, yeah. why it is? Yeah. Well, you really, I mean, we're all so numb to them because if I said, hey, what's a Pringle? They'd be like, oh, yeah, it's, it's like this. We all know. But when, if you really look at it, you're like, what is that? People yeah. eat it. I know it. Why? Well, I know what it tastes like. But if you ask me what it is, <laughs> chip-like food. <laughs> it, it, I don't even know if the actual yeah. definition of food could apply to what that yeah, is. Yeah, no, for sure. There's some stuff we put in our bodies that it's very, very scary. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the, you know it's designed by the scientists to make it as palatable and delicious as mm-hmm. as possible, so that you consume as much of it as you can. And you know, there's a time and a place for it, but you don't want it to be the basis of your diet when you focus on protein you focus focus on fiber you focus on stuff that i call it the great grandpa rule Mm -hmm. if your great grandpa recognized it there's a good chance that there's a good place for it in your diet and if it would have given your great grandpa a stroke by walking down the cereal aisle and seeing all the colors and the craziness that's going on in those middle aisles of the grocery store then you're going to want to minimize those yeah Uh, animal based I mean is that do you do fall into any particular I don't like groups and I don't like diets and I don't like fads but if I asked you you said I need to eat quality food you said protein has to be the cornerstone of that statement what are we looking at what what are my options i don't really label myself as anything i'm more of a flexible dieter when it comes mm-hmm. to that with intermittent fasting to help control calories so you know I, i'm not running away from ultra processed foods but i don't really keep it in the house i'll have some on the weekends i go to restaurants at, on the weekends without worrying about what type of oil they're using things like that mm-hmm. but uh you, you're probably not going to see uh, cinnamon toast crunch or Doritos <laughs> place very often, but I love a cookie just as much as anyone. Sure. Yeah. And, and when it comes to the eating on program or eating off program, it's important to know which, which one is which and where you're at with that. Yeah. A lot of people don't really understand the difference between eating on program or off program. So they kind of just eat and then they wonder why nothing is really happening or worse, they're getting worse. Yeah. And that's what the first thing I ask them. Like, okay, well, what what is your, what do you consider to be your program? I'm not even saying my program because I don't really write meal plans. What is it that you consider to be your everyday, consistent, healthy meal plan? And when are you cheating? It's important to know when that is. Yeah, for sure. You a gotta, lot of people don't. You got to have a framework and you have to have some non-negotiables. It can never be a free-for-all. You can have flexibility, but at the same time, you can't go off the rails and you got to find what works for you so if you're the type of guy that's traveling a lot and you're not going to necessarily have healthy options yeah and stay really really dialed in on those four or five days a week where you're at home so you can have some uh the flexibility and not being stressed out about trying to find the perfect thing when you're at the phoenix airport you know? yeah what do you say on this on the the topic of time management is certainly one that comes up a lot for yeah parents yep. parents but dads certainly what what do you speak to that when people say no i just don't have time yeah there are a few things don't make me do a time audit on you that's the first thing because i'm going to find <laughs> six hours of netflix i'm going to find all kinds of stuff that's that's filling up your time if uh jay-z and oprah have enough time in the day you have enough time in the day and everybody's got challenges but doing as best as you can to plan out the week meaning on sunday figuring out what days and times you're going to work out making it non-negotiable mm-hmm. all right so that means you're waking up early in the morning. That means you also have to plan your bedtime. Be non-negotiable with that because if you wake up groggy, you're going to skip your workout. You're running out of time. You're not going to hit all your workouts and you're going to be discouraged and you're going to be more likely to fall off. So plan out your week. Be ruthless with that. Plan out your workouts. Plan out what you're going to eat. I say that at the beginning of the week, you should roughly know what you're eating for just about every single meal. And I don't say if to be as disciplined as ronnie coleman or jay cutler in their prime but you should know right monday through wednesday i'm gonna prep some food on sunday i went to the grocery store gonna have that or at the very least we we know what we're eating as a family on those days have healthy snacks be prepared with that so you are not uh running to the vending machine um and then waking up early i'm big on that you want to make sure that you're starting off every single morning in control you don't want to be in a reactive state where you're stressed out because that just sets off all kinds of triggers you're gonna be stressed out you're gonna jack up your cortisol and we don't want that chronically elevated so the more you can prepare the week the more you can prepare to win and you just got to be ruthless with your timing and time management anyone can do it if they really want it absolutely a very common theme that i run into with my clients who are parents and i'll just say parents because i get both parents will a lot of times use their children as their reason for not eating right I have to eat what my kids eat. 
or not going to the gym. I don't have time to go to the gym. And I use what I like to call the airplane analogy, which yeah, is that if your airplane goes down and the oxygen mask drops, what's the first thing they tell you to do? Yeah, put it on yourself. Put it on yourself. Yeah. And then after it's securely fastened on yourself and you feel confident, then you put it on your kid. Your children should not dictate your health. You are responsible for theirs. They are not responsible for yours. Yeah. You are the adult in the equation. And in order to provide the best possible level of care for anyone, kids included, you have to set the example for health. And it seems like this can have a wide spectrum of results. We see, as I mentioned earlier, we have an obesity epidemic. Yep. And how many times do we see obese parents with obese kids? Just look at Honey Boo Boo, you know? <laughs> that's, that's the first example that comes to mind. Well, that, uh, this is an awesome point. And the, the kids notice everything. They're going to see you sitting on the couch drinking beer and eating pizza. But they're also going to see you getting on the ground in saying, no, dad doesn't eat that. That's that's a sometimes food and, and, and doing push-ups and playing sports and, and, and things like that. So th to say that your kids are the reason you don't want to work out is, is totally flawed. They, your kids are going to want a healthy grandparent someday for their kids. Your kids are going to want someone that is there in their late 70s, 80s, and beyond and not hooked up to oxygen and not on a ton of meds. So the, the way you have to look at it is be the example that you want your kids to be someday and like i said when it all comes down to prioritization if you prioritize Amen. if you don't prioritize your health then that's going to reflect that's and that's going to affect generations so it's not not always easy i mean i was very very lucky and i don't know how much this affected me you know i never talked to a therapist uh to, to do a deep dive but very very early on and i don't think she realized she was doing it but my mom was going to aerobics classes at the mm -hmm. ymca and I was three years old, and I remember this. Some of my earliest memories, and this is what moms do. This is mo mom's exercise. I'm yes. Like, All right, it's normal. And I remember throughout my childhood, her taking me to the YMCA. I'd go to the play area or whatever, and she would normalize it. So mm -hmm. at the same time, if she wasn't taking care of herself, it would normalize that. So I think it's one of the best things that you can do. And I think taking that effort is going to impact you. Obviously, you're going to feel better. You're going to have more energy. You're going to come home from work and... Uh, not be running on fumes and it sets the example for them to be able to do the same thing someday mm -hmm. a very controversial way to sort of water down everything you and i just said to one very simple question should parents prioritize their health over the health of their children what do you think well, I think there's a balance. Obviously, you have to be there for the kids. You know, you, if if the kids are home alone because you're at the gym, then we have we have a problem. So I think there becomes a balance. So that being said, you don't necessarily have to be super jacked and competing in powerlifting, but just getting yourself to a healthy body weight, healthy body fat percentage, and and making good good choices to your diet i think that's going to go a long way so you have to find that balance that works for you that prioritizes your health and gets you moving and gets you you know statistically healthy rather than just being super aesthetic mm -hmm. you found your way to your own health and fitness on your own with very little help or any external factors if someone is trying to take that first step how would you recommend that they start I would say, like like I said before, that I don't think going on Instagram and scrolling for hours and days is the best best advice. But I would say maybe just get like one book or do one program and stick to that and see it through. To do you have a recommendation? A book? A program? A oh, coach? Man. Well, obviously me. Obviously if you're you. <laughs> dead, come to me. But the resources that help me out. Um, you just want a, a quick book i mean mike matthews had a good one bigger leaner stronger that mm -hmm. was good um on the nutrition side of thing you know uh alan Arg alan aragon's book on flexible dieting I, I think was really really good i would say just pick one thing follow it to the letter and, and mm -hmm. see it through to the end in, instead of bouncing around from shiny object to shiny object find a really good coach yeah, and that's that's another another alternative. If, yeah. you, if you are somebody who I'll, I'll say this, 
if if your big excuse for not reaching the potential that you want is because you don't have time, which as you stated, you and I both know that's flawed. You yeah. don't have an it's not that you have not enough time, you have not enough prioritization. But that being said, let's say for the sake of argument that your time is just really crunched. Yep. Well, if your time is extremely crunched, then it stands to reason you are probably, if we're talking about somebody who's got a family and somebody who's you're probably working a lot. That means you're making enough money to get a coach. That's true. Go out. If your time is crunched so bad that you don't have the time to research any of this, and you know that about yourself, and that's held you in place for this long, go get a coach. Coaching is awesome. Coaching's changed my life. I've had, I have my own coaches. I currently have my own coaches, and mm-hmm. they get me out of my comfort zone. And the biggest benefit I found with having a coach isn't necessarily them telling you the exact tactic to do, but when you're around other people who are doing it, it normalizes it. Like, oh man, this person's doing this thing with their business or this person's getting a six pack with the same exact resources that I have. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is what they're doing. I can do it too. So it takes out those limiting beliefs when you see other people that you're surrounding yourself by doing the same thing in a very similar circumstance to you. So yeah, coaching is absolutely incredible. And if you're spending more on your bar tab than you are on your fitness, then we really have a prioritization problem there. Oh, yeah. Oh, nine times out of 10, there's an imbalance in where you're placing your resources. Yeah. It, almost anybody can go out and get themselves a coach. Just 100%. About. I'm not telling anyone how to spend their money, but just look at your bank statement. You're, you're going to be surprised. How, how much are you spending on stuff that's not serving you? Versus mm-hmm. how much you serving uh, spending on stuff that is serving you in a positive way, and you may be surprised, maybe really surprised. So do that self audit if you need to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's an important thing for all of us to do, no matter what kind of subject we're talking about. Figuring out where you're spending your money and where you're spending your time, yeah. how much of it is going toward things that serve you, and how much of it isn't. I mean, that's something that I mean, I, I see myself that, have done I that. I see yeah. that every April, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that the truth? Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I, I I see it more and more the the lack of motivation, the lack of time management. And I, I think that is probably, that's probably the one most common thing that the people who come and talk to me state as the issue is that they don't have the time yeah. to, to, to put toward this. Well, an- another important thing I forgot to touch on, big part of my program is I make them set goals i think goal setting and having a vision is really really important Mm -hmm. you know having something to focus on to to reverse engineer you're going to find the time like if you look at what you're currently doing and ask yourself where's this going to take me in 20 years 10 years 30 years whatever the time frame may be Hmm. and you look at get a give yourself an honest look at how those habits are stacking you may have like a really, really big shift in how you're thinking. Oh my God, if I keep doing this, I keep putting on two pounds a year, three pounds a year, then by the time I'm 60, I'm going to be obese and statistically setting myself up for heart disease. But if mm-hmm. you reverse engineer that and say, all right, I want to be uh, a healthy weight, I want to be active, I want to be the type of guy that you know still plays basketball with the kids, then having that clear vision and then revisiting that every single day, you're going to change how you set up your week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it works really well. Similar, uh, similar to a concept uh, Jordan Peterson talks about: uh, creation of your own hell. Yeah. He familiar with that when he talks about that? He he uh, basically uses it as a reverse goal setting tactic. It's bloody awesome. It's yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a reverse goal setting tactic with his clients when he's talking about okay, you know, if we let's say we just take the next five years and we play out what is going to happen if you do go to the gym, if you do change your life, if you do get on a great diet, if you do spend more time on your health and your family and everything or anything in life. But then he also says, you know, okay, now do the opposite. Now play out the next five years and let's say you make no change or you continue along the path that you're on, whatever it is, addiction, uh, problems with inactivity, financial woes, whatever it is that you're doing now that's causing you your own personal hell. Yeah. Play that out to its conclusion in five years. If that doesn't scare you into choosing option one, well, then you have a bigger problem. But that should be a motivator in and of itself. I'm 60 pounds overweight. I eat terrible five days out of the week. I've been drinking beer Thursday through Sunday every day this week. If I do that for five years without stopping, I'm probably going to be a type two diabetic. Yeah. If nothing changes, nothing changes. And you have to give yourself an honest look. And that's not always easy. People don't don't like looking in the mirror literally and uh, and, and, metaphor, and yeah. metaphorically sometimes. And that's not an easy, easy pill to swallow. But when you do it, you become really, really empowered and 
get an honest look about how your future is going to play out. And I don't think guys give themselves enough credit to, to how much control they actually have over it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. On that particular topic, what do you see, because your demographic is men, because this is the target audience that you speak to the most, what do you see as the connection between inactivity and mental health? Oh, man, I know it's been done wonders for, for my mental health and not 100% sure on the data, but I know, you know, exercise isn't going to solve all your problems, mm-hmm. but it's going to help some of them. Even if it's just 5%, 10%, it makes you... 10% happier, 10% more confident, 10% more productive mm-hmm. at work, then that's all going to contribute positively to your mental health. I, I can't imagine a life where I don't exercise. And I think some people just need to start doing it to actually see it for themselves. It's hard to explain, but once you start feeling it and you start feel, uh, experiencing it and just how you feel energetically, uh, th- th- I mean, it, it's going to reinforce itself really, really quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see a correlation between inactivity and the mental health decline of men just staying within the American population? It's it's become quite evident that we have a mental health crisis. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many school shooters do you know were avid weightlifters? They were just sitting in their place Yes. Writing manifestos the whole time, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I'm not saying that's the, the the solution to it, but I think any mental health it's program a correlation, have, if yeah, not a causation, it's certainly correlated. It's definitely a correlation. Yes. No denying that, and I think mental uh, exercise should be part of any mental health journey, even if it's just going for a walk and listening to a a good podcast like mm-hmm. this one. I think yeah. that's going to help you a lot, a lot more than isolating yourself. What they found is that. Some of the people that are living the longest, that that there's a dietary component to it. There's a little exercise component to it, but just making sure you have good mental health and surrounding yourself with other people and having good relationships Mm -hmm. is is another huge component. Absolutely. And it happens to us all. It doesn't even matter what your lifestyle is. We all have down times, down days, maybe even down series of days where we just don't feel that great. We're human, 100%. Yes. Yes. But whenever I get somebody on the off chance, I get on this conversation with someone in a very serious, intimate setting, and they tell me that they're dealing with something like this, I tell them, okay, well, I'll tell you what, man, you know, I'm not... I'm not going to say this is going to solve all your problems. Seems like you've got some stuff that's going on outside of your control. But I'll tell you what is inside of your control. Wake up with the sun for the next three days and watch it rise. Go immediately into some sort of a workout of some kind. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, nothing. Eat, eat. I I usually say eat animal-based, but eat organic animal based and veggies eat what your grandfather could catch or grow for the next week do those things for one week and at come back to me next tuesday tell me if you don't feel better yeah you're not going to be transformed physically but your mental state tell me in one week you don't feel better yeah it's probably going to be a lot better that's one of the things i love about fitness there's so many things that are in our control we can't control traffic we can't control the weather you can't control what other people think about you but you can control how you treat your body Mm -hmm. and your mind and your body are directly connected and when you're moving your body and you're treating your body well you're going to treat your mind well as well Mm -hmm. also what you put in your mind that's a big thing too for sure especially i mean right now could not be a better time to be having this conversation we've we've got an election year we've got a down economy people are struggling right now what you you know all those things are happening and all those things are out of your control. We're going to yeah. have the election whether you want to or not. All these things are just going to happen. But you don't have to sit there and just watch the news. That's, That's another true. single well, thing. The, the, there's there's a component to that there. I don't know if I'm going off in a totally different direction here. But if you listen to enough people telling you that you have no chance or that you're a victim or the odds are stacked against you, you're going to start believing it. But if you listen mm-hmm. to people who pump you up and tell you you have control... And to start taking ownership and you start applying those principles, you're going to find that that's the better path to go down. So put good stuff into your brain. Mm -hmm. So start surrounding yourself with different people. Start reading different books. Start listening to different podcasts and watching different stuff on on the internet or on TV. And you're going to dramatically change how you live your life and how you feel. And that's something that's easy to do. That's, like I said, 100% in your control. Yeah. You mentioned people. That's another enormous one. Look at your five people. Who are your five pillars? Who are the five people that in your week you see the most? 
how are they? Are they impacting your the way you think, the way you speak? Are they toxic? Are they depressing? Are they or are they positive? Do they actually want to see you succeed? Yeah. Very few people want to actually see you succeed. Try to find people within those five that actually do. That's a that's a huge one that I think and and that's a tough one. Just like you know, not being able to look in the mirror, literally or metaphorically. Not being able to look at your five people around you and say, I need to get rid of two of these people. Yeah. Two I've of these people. That. Sucks to do. Sucks to do. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to have. Feels like a breakup. It does. <laughs> well, the way I've done it is you don't, ne- I didn't necessarily have to have like a conversation and be like, listen, we can't hang out anymore. This isn't working. <laughs> you just find yourself doing different things. That's the, what's yeah. worked for me. And you start gravitating toward different, towards different people. Cause yeah, I mean, it's almost a cliche at this point, but you're. You're the average of the five people you hang out with the most. So start putting yourself in a room with people who are going to make you better instead of the people mm-hmm. who are going to bring you down. And that's fairly easy to do. And people who are succeeding ahead of you. People, people who yeah. are succeeding ahead of you have got to be, I would say, in my opinion, at least three of those five people. Yeah. You can have two compadres that are right along the same line as you. Maybe there are people who are working in the same industry as you. That's even cooler. But you need three people in your five that in some area of their life, they are succeeding above you yeah. because it gives you something to shoot for. You can't just exist in an echo chamber and think everything is awesome all the time because you're doing it. You need to see, oh, he's doing something that I'm not. He's yeah. doing it really, really well. I need to try to emulate some of that in my life. 100%. It normalizes it. When the things uh, when things are normalized, you realize you can do it too. I think Henry Ford said, never be the smartest person in the room. He said he yes. just surrounded himself. He said, I was a dumb guy, but I surrounded myself by brilliant people and they did the work for me there's a lot to be learned for that absolutely getting past the wall of insecurity and realizing that if you're the dumbest one in the room you have the most to learn and that's a good thing that's That's not not a a bad thing yeah and that's not a hard thing for me too (laughs) yeah same here (laughs) same here man that's why i love podcasting I i get to talk to people that are totally different than me that are usually succeeding ahead of me and that i get to you know get mentorship from yeah that's why this is great getting to have conversations with people let me ask you this have you've had a lot of talented and successful and very brilliant people on this podcast sure not including me but (laughs) have you found that you your life has just gotten better from being able to interview and pick the brains of people definitely definitely who has had the biggest impact are you comfortable sharing that (sighs) Depends, man. It's 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 hard to pick one person and say they've had the biggest impact because everybody in here comes in and talks about things that are different. Uh, Miguel Aguilar, he had an incredible story. He's the president of Self Made Training Facility. I don't know if you ever heard of him. No, he's I'll have to look him up. Incredible. Um, it's 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 different. Everybody comes in and talks about something different. I mean. Sammy the Bull didn't impact my life in any way, but hearing him talk about the stories of his past was so captivating, and yeah. it and it taught me a lot about storytelling. I mean, it taught me a lot about how bad most people from our generation are at telling a story, and how good people from his generation were at doing it. Yeah. And, and and so it's everyone's different. I, I learn. I, I I think I try to learn and remember one or two things from everybody I talk to. It's. Heidi Powell, she's incredible. She we talked about weight loss and nothing else the entire time, and she just yeah. has such an incredible perspective on it. How she used to get her clients and literally live with them and hand literally spoon feed them oh, all wow. the way to progress through that television show. It, everybody's everybody's different, and sometimes it's not always like good things that I learn. Yeah. Sometimes. I'll have a guest on here. I'll be like, wow, you know what I learned? I don't ever want to be that <laughs> asshole my entire life. Yeah, and that's happened too. You got to, man, you got to have the really, really, really bad ones in, in your circle as well. I imagine. You, you got to meet them. You not go by. You, know? well, you, ha- you, have to be, you have to be exposed. I think, it's, I think it's unhealthy to never be exposed to toxic people. Because then you you'll you'll exist your life in sort of like a sheep's wool where you think, oh no, no one out there would ever really hurt me. Nobody out there would intentionally take advantage of me. Yeah, yeah they would. Yeah, no, oh they would. yeah, they would. I've seen that. It oh, sucks. it's it sucks. And, and but you need to know that you need to meet those people and you yeah. talk to those people and you just realize who they are. You learn to recognize patterns and how to avoid it too. So who's oh, your man. who's your dream guest? Who would you love to have on that you haven't had on yet? There's a few. You got to speak to this too. Uh, I would love. To, I would love to interview Tim Grover. Yeah, I would love, love his books. I I don't want to say. I mean Joe Rogan, sure, but everybody would like to do Joe Rogan. Um, man, I, I would love to interview Shaquille O'Neal. Oh, he's awesome. I would have given anything to have interviewed Kobe Bryant. He, he would have been. Great he too. would have been. He would have been the number one guy. I probably would have wanted to meet with. Um, 
Yeah, either of those guys would be incredible. Yeah, all the, good. The Rock, though, honestly, <laughs> no, probably not. That really? Would be, nah, that'd just be me wanting to ride the clout. He's, <laughs> yeah, the Rock, it, he, frankly. You guys can do a shot of tequila and push the sled. I'm and... <laughs> not going to say it wouldn't be a lot of fun yeah. to do. I mean, I would. Get, we would be lifting with The Rock. That'd that be would amazing. be incredible. I'll, okay, elbow. <laughs> I'll tell you what I would like to do. I would love to interview Shane Gillis. Shane's hilarious. Shane his Gillis would be hysterical, yeah. especially after... I just watched Tires. I don't know if you've seen that yet. I saw that. Yeah. You watch it? Yeah. I loved it. I've really seen funny. it twice. It's yeah. hysterical. But yeah, that's 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 kind of. I, I like to just take from everywhere. I would want random people, serious people, authors, comedians, everybody. Shane, besides him being hilarious, the part of his story that I love is he went from having one of the worst things that could possibly happen to your career happen and still come back and and be even more successful. He got kicked off of SNL before he was even on SNL, and that would crush a lot of people. Some people would probably kill themselves. Honestly, if that happened, some people would probably kill themselves. It's such a blow to your ego to be booked and then canceled and everything by them. Achieving your dream and then just having it taken away from you before you even get a chance to, to see it. And then... By being persistent and, you know, surrounding himself with the right people, he was able to be even also, bigger. Yeah, and he was also very true to himself through yeah. that whole thing. He wasn't like, wait, what do you not want me to say? Because I'll not say it. I'll do whatever you want. Just get me on the show. Like, That's he was like, no. That's tempting. He's yeah. like, no, I, I, this is the way I do comedy. So, you know, he's big. <laughs> he, he, that's him. He's like, yeah, it's me. I'm not changing. You yeah. can change to me, but I'm not going anywhere. So I love that about him. And I know and I, I know he's he's going to do very, very well. Well, let's get him on here, man. Let's try. <laughs> we'll do our best. Um, so if people want to work with you, Steve, where would they go? Where would they start? Yeah, just go to my Instagram page or my TikTok page. Instagram is probably easier to, to navigate. Uh, on my link tree on my Instagram, you can find my free fast start guide. If you're looking for a, a free resource to get you started, you're going to learn my key principles on nutrition and training. We'll definitely get you on the right foot there. You can apply to my program on there. So just find me on all my social media. That's going to be the uh, best p- way to get connected with me. And if you want to send me a DM, say hi. I'd appreciate that as well. Awesome. Awesome, Steve. Thanks, buddy. That was a lot of fun. So much, man. This is amazing. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming in. Thank you guys so much for watching that episode of Becoming the 1% Podcast. If you like the content and you want to see more of it, hit the like and subscribe. Activate that notification bell as well. We really appreciate it. If you guys want to see more of it, we actually have the Becoming the 1% Instagram and the podcast is available on Spotify. For our socials, we have Strict Vision Athletics on Instagram. We have it on YouTube and we have it on TikTok.